Good morning, y'all. Uh, several years back, there was a popular uh, sermon style going around that was called Talk Back. And what happened was, uh, after the sermon was over, uh, the pastor would open up the floor for other people to talk. <laughs> I never tried that. And maybe now you know why. <laughs> Our scripture today comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to begin reading with verse 1 and read down through verse 10. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to follow along with me. And if you don't, you're welcome to listen as we read about a vision that the Apostle Paul had and the thorn that he talked about that was in his side. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Paul writes, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or what I say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations... Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power might rest upon me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me this morning? Gracious God, we are so thankful once again to gather together in this place as a community of faith to lift ourselves up to you in worship. We're thankful, Lord, for the way that your Holy Spirit has worked through our gathering thus far. And we pray, Lord, that your Spirit would continue to work among us. Lord, I pray that in the next few minutes that I might decrease in this place in order that Jesus Christ might increase. And I pray, Lord, that my words would be your words. And God, as always, we humbly ask that you would open our ears, open our minds, but most of all, dear God, open our hearts, so that the words that you have for us today might be more for us than simply more information. But we pray, Lord, that we might find your words transforming. And Lord, we pray that we might leave this place as transformed people because we stopped for a few moments to hear from you. All this gracious God we ask. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, it is in His name that we've offered this prayer today, saying, Amen. Probably 15, 16, 17 years ago, there was a book that, that came out uh, that, that revolutionized uh, how we think about our strengths. It was called Discover Your Strengths. And the fascinating thing about this book was that the author's premise was that we spend way too much time trying to shore up our weaknesses 
when we instead should operate out of our strengths. Uh, one of the most maddening things about the book, as far as I was concerned, was that you took this test to discover which ones of 32 strengths you had, and they only told you your top five. Because again, the premise of the whole book was, if you operate out of your strengths, you'll be better off than shoring up your weaknesses. And to this day, I'm dying to know what the other 27 were in what order, and especially what was in the bottom five. What were those weaknesses? You see, we live in a world that values strength, that values power, that that values people who can make decisions, people who can operate out of strength. And the people of the church in Corinth were no different. Corinth must have been a really, really tough church for Paul. Uh, he wrote them two letters uh, that are in our New Testament, First and Second Corinthians. Uh, there's some evidence that he might have written a third letter that is lost to us. But Corinth was a, was a wild city. It was a multicultural city, and it was not a city that was very friendly uh, to Christianity at the time. And Paul kept having to write to the church in Corinth uh, because they kept having problems. And in the passage I read to you today, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth because they're having a problem because the leaders are saying that they're having specific visions from God. And they're trying to outdo each other in these visions. And who's getting God to speak to them? I had a good friend years and years ago uh, who was the kind of person that it didn't matter what you said, he had done something just a little bit more. It didn't matter what you bought, he bought something a little better. It didn't matter what you'd accomplished, he'd accomplished a little bit more. Have you ever known anybody like that? It was always the one-up thing. And that's what the church at Corinth reminds me of. They were trying to one-up each other on their visions, on the way that they saw God. So in this passage that I read to you, Paul starts out by saying, I know a man who was caught up into the third heaven. I know a man who had a wonderful vision of paradise. We think Paul was talking probably about himself, but he doesn't really say. He keeps talking about himself in the third person. And he says, yeah, this wonderful, wonderful vision of things that can't even be expressed. And then Paul says something interesting. He says, just to make sure that I wasn't becoming conceited, in our culture we might say, just to make sure we weren't getting too big for our britches, that's what we'd say, Paul said that there was a, a thorn in his side. He calls it a, a messenger of Satan, something that kept nagging at him. For years, scholars have tried to figure out what the thorn in Paul's side was. Was it a physical ailment? Was it a mental ailment? Was there something else that was going on? What was going on in Paul's life? What was the thorn in the flesh? And I don't think that's the real point. The fact was that, that Paul writes, he said, I asked God to take it away from me three times. And what we expect to read after that is that after the third time that, that Paul asked God to take it away, that God took it away, that it was gone. But the answer that Paul gets from God is fascinating. It's fascinating. God says, no, I'm not going to take this away. Because my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in you in weakness. My power is made perfect in you in weakness. It would be strange, wouldn't it, if, if we all went around boasting about our weaknesses? Boasting about the things that, that we were weakest at, the things that we weren't any good at. I hardly ever go around boasting about the fact that I can't use tools like other men can. For some reason. 
My father has the ability to look at anything and use tools and fix them. And if you want to hear a preacher cuss, <laughs> hand me a tool. Hand me a tool. I can't figure out how the things work. They don't work for me, and it's a weakness. And oftentimes when there's a problem, if, if there's a problem with a car or something, I often go and I stand around and do this. And somebody will say, well, I think the thingamabob came out of the doodad. And I'm like, that's what it sounds like to me too. That happened to my car one time. You see, we don't go around boasting about our weaknesses because we think it's more important to be strong. But the truth is, is that our strengths don't bring us closer to God, do they? What we do well, what we're strong in, that never brings us closer to God. What brings us closer to God, what helps us to understand God's grace more than anything else, are our weaknesses, are the times that we fail, the times that we aren't who we could be, the times that instead of being strong, we fall flat on our face, and our weaknesses are very apparent. In May of 2014, I got bronchitis. This was not a new thing for me. I'd had bronchitis. I usually got it at least once or twice a year. It's been happening for the last 20 years. I go to the doctor. I'd be sick for a week. I'd take a dose of antibiotics, sometimes two, and then I'd get better. I was really sick for two weeks. I went and got some more antibiotics. I was sick for two more weeks, and I got to the point where I literally could not get out of bed. And if I did get out of bed, I could only be up for two or three hours before I was so fatigued that I had to go lay back down. And it would have been something if this lasted a month or two or three. But brothers and sisters, for almost four months, I had the energy only to get out of bed for three to four hours every day. The doctors kept running tests, and, and if you all have been through this, and some of you have, you know that when they don't know, they start looking for the worst things, and then they come down. And I can remember sitting uh, with my family doctor, the doctor I've seen for years after I had the second of three heart tests, and it came back negative. And the doctor said, well, that's good. He said, that's good. He said, there's nothing wrong with your heart. I said, good. I said, you can't tell me what's wrong with me. What's good about that? And for years, brothers and sisters, I heard people say that they struggled. They struggled with diseases that they sometimes could not get up. And what I thought to myself was, if your mind wants you to get up, you can get up. Until the summer of 2014, because my mind could not force my physical body to do anything. And as I laid around that summer, I got really angry with God. Because I said, God, I'm supposed to be doing some good work for you. I'm supposed to be out there doing some things for you, and I know how you work. All you've got to do is take your cosmic finger, come down here, run it across my body, heal me, and we'll be right back. So just any time. And nothing happened. And pretty soon I got angry, and then I got depressed. Because people were saying to me, if you wanted to get out of bed, you could. But the truth was, I couldn't. And I learned something very important that summer about weakness and about God's grace. Because you see, we think that, that God's favor, God's grace is only poured upon us 
when we are doing what God wants us to do. But that's not what grace really is, brothers and sisters, and I found this out. God pours His grace out upon us even when we're weak, even when we've messed up, even when we can't do anything for God, which is the definition, the very definition of grace. It's God's favor. It's unmerited. In other words, we can't do anything to earn it. We can't do anything to, to get it to come. It's what God gives us freely. That's the very definition of grace. And ever since that summer, I, I've looked at strengths and weaknesses much differently. Paul understood that when God said, I'm not going to take these away from you, my grace is sufficient. My power comes in your weakness. Paul understood that what that meant was when you're weak, you have no strength of your own, and you must rely on God's strength. God's grace. And brothers and sisters, that's a powerful difference. A powerful difference in how we often think things should be. We think we should be strong. We think we should be able to hold up. We think we should be able to do it ourselves. But God's grace comes to us when we are weak. when we are beat down, when we think we can't go one more step, that's when God's grace, that's when God's grace is most fully made present to us. And that's why, brothers and sisters, Paul was able to write in hardships, persecutions, trials, when things don't go well, when I don't feel well, when I'm struggling, I know that's when God does God's best work. And that's why Paul could say, when I am weak, then, then I am strong. Because it's only when I'm weak, when we're weak, that we can feel the full power of God's amazing grace falling upon us. Sometimes I know that there are those of us who, who struggle with perfectionism. We long to be perfect. We want to be perfect. We want everything to be perfect, everything that we say, everything that we do. And quite often those of us who have perfectionistic tendencies we won't even attempt something that we can't do 100%. And I hope that you heard what I just said. We won't attempt something that we can't do 100%, that we can't make perfect. But the truth is, friends, the truth is that God loves us just as we are. And God doesn't love us any less when we're weak than when we're strong when we're sick and when we're well, when we've got everything together or when things are falling apart. God loves us just the same, just the same. And the truth is, is that when we are weak it is when God's grace is most fully present in us. It's when we realize that we can't do it ourselves, that we can't be perfect, nor should we be perfect, it is then that we recognize that God is with us, that God walks alongside us, and that His amazing grace is what holds us up. And it's not about being perfect at all. Because the truth is, if you're human, you're going to make mistakes. If you're human, you're going to fail. If you're human, you're going to fall. That's the truth. The great hope that Paul gives us is that when we are weak, 
just like when he was weak, even when there's something that we ask God to take away and God doesn't, even at that point, God's grace is poured upon us even more than we could imagine. And brothers and sisters, it's not all about being perfect. Any of you who came in here today thinking that I was perfect, my wife Kim is here today. I invite you to just talk to her for a few minutes. She'll let you know that is most certainly not the case. But the good news is, is that I don't have to be perfect and you don't have to be perfect because the one perfect person was Jesus Christ. And because of what Christ did for us, we have grace. And that grace is sufficient. It's sufficient. And it's made even more powerful in our weaknesses and when we are imperfect. If we could have the slide, please. There's this great quote from Brene Brown. I don't know if you all are familiar with her. She's an author. She's written a couple of books in the last few years. But, but I love this quote. Have the courage to be imperfect. Have the courage to be imperfect. Because when we're imperfect is when God is doing God's best work in us. When we are imperfect is when God's grace pours upon us and through us. When we are imperfect, we recognize that it doesn't matter how strong we are. What really matters is how graceful God is. Amen? It's not about how strong we are. It's about how graceful God is. Have the courage to be imperfect because it is, as the Scripture says, when we are weak that we are strong. So if you're feeling weak today, if you're feeling not up to it, if you've blown it somewhere in your life, if you feel like you've fallen and you just can't seem to get up, then it's time to praise the Lord because God's grace is indeed sufficient. God's grace is with you and God's power is always perfected. Perfected in our weaknesses. Because when we are weak, glory, hallelujah, when we are weak, then we are strong in God's grace. Amen.